than the X-rays that are produced by the sun. So it has to be an object completely different from the sun. By 1964, about a dozen sources had been detected, and the groups that were active at that time were ASNE, Ricardo's group, Herb Friedman, NRL's group, Lockheed. Shortly after that, MIT followed, Hale brought, Sal Rappaport, maybe in the audience, I know that Hale is, George Clark, I hope he is in the audience, and Jim Overbeck were active at MIT, and then there was Lawrence Radiation Laboratories in Livermore. In 1964 came the first optical identification with an X-ray source, and that was the Krat Nebula. There was already a source known that was called Taurus X1, and everyone sort of suspected it might be the Krat. The Krat Nebula is a supernova remnant from the year 1054. And Herb Friedman realized that the moon was going to occult the Krat Nebula. And he timed several rockets in a row that he launched when the moon was going over the Krat Nebula. And he reasoned if the Krat Nebula is the source of X-rays, the X-rays will disappear during the flight. An incredible idea, and Herb was right. It was the Krat Nebula. You see at the top the Krat Nebula. It's about six arc minutes in the sky. From here to here, it's a supernova remnant. You see the rim of the moon here. And what you see here is the counting rate in X-rays. And this is 400 seconds, what was the duration of the rocket flights. He used more than one rocket. And here you see the counting rate very slowly going down as the moon comes over, comes over the Krat Nebula. So that was a source of X-rays that will, had a huge size of several arc minutes. In 1966, Fischer, Phil Fischer, published a paper in which he compared the flux, the X-ray flux of seven sources. Some had been seen by Lockheed and some by NRL, and he compared the intensities of the two different observations from the two groups, the same source. And if you look at that, I will show you a slide of it now. May I have my first slide? Now, if I were you, I would say, well, could Walter for this particular colloquium not prepare a better slide than this one? <laughs> and the answer is, yet he could have, but he didn't want to. Because this is the first slide that I made when in January 1966, I came here to MIT. I made this slide myself. It's 47 years old. <laughs> and if you don't like it, tough luck. <laughs> what you see here, though, which is important, you see here the observations of these sources by one group. And here you see the observations by the other group. This is the number of counts per square centimeter per second, one group, the other group. And here you see the ratio between these two. And then you see sickness x1, you see 0.2. Well, if that's not variability, you wonder what is. But Fisher did not say sickness x1 is variable. You must understand in these early days, there was no believable intercalibration between instruments of one group and the other group. And in fact, if you flew the rocket, your own rocket, twice in a row, you didn't even know whether it performed exactly the same way as it did before. So he writes the following, I quote him, because time variation in X-ray flux 
may someday be observed. He didn't claim it had been observed. May someday be observed. It may be worth noting that the fluxes used for table four were derived from three different rocket flights made over only a five month time interval. That's enough for this slide. 1966 brought the optical identification of SCOEX-1. It was an, um, a collaboration between ASD and MIT. Hale Brot was part of that collaboration. And they used a new kind of collimator which was invented by Minoru Ode, who was at MIT at that time. It's, it's, we use, we call it the modulation collimator. It is an instrument with a large field of view of several square degrees, but an intrinsic capability of angular resolution of arc minutes, or even better. It's interesting that when you go to Japan, they call it the Oda collimator. It was flown, and the flight was successful. And immediately after the flight, because of the modulation pattern that they recorded, they knew that the source was smaller than 20 arc seconds. So way smaller than the Crab Nebula. Smaller than 20 arc seconds, well, the idea came up, maybe it's a star. It took longer to analyze the position of the, of the source with the, with the cold modulation collimator. So the first thing they saw immediately, that it was a size smaller than 20 arc seconds. And Yugaku and co-workers of Tokyo Astronomy Observatory started to search the sky over several square degrees to search for a star that might be SCOEX-1. And all they knew that it might be a star, which could be wrong. And they said, they found one that they say, it's very bright in UV, 13th magnitude star, and they claimed that might be SCOEX-1. Turned out later, that they were right. The error boxes of the modulation collimator were worked out. Of course, it took a little longer. I want to show you the error boxes. And indeed, the Yukaku star was in one of them. First, what you see here are those hashed areas. Hey, oh. That's what happened on the second rocket flight, remember, in 1961. <laughs> the window didn't open. Uh, you see here these hashed areas, which are error boxes that were obtained with rocket flights. I see here the name George Clark, so he must have been first author. This is one of his, and this is one of the rocket flights. This was a rocket flight. And this, this is two degrees, by the way, two by two degrees. And this whole area, was searched by Yugaku. This whole area was searched to find SCOEX-1. And then when the collimator, modulation collimator results were known, the source was found in this box, and the blow-up of this box is here, and you see a one by two arc minute error region and a one by two arc minute error region, and in this one was the Yugaku star. There was no doubt that the optical identification of SCOEX-1 had been found. Now, once you know the optical identification, you know both the optical flux and you know the X-ray flux. You may not know the distance, but you know the ratio of the two, because they are at the same distance, of course. If we take the sun and we take the X-ray luminosity and we divide that by the optical luminosity, then even though it's highly variable, it's about 10 to the minus 6. Only one part in a million of the sun are x-rays. If you take SCOEX-1 and you do the same, Lx over L up, you find 10 to the third, 1,000. The difference between those numbers nine orders of magnitude. This is an object that emits optical light. Forget the X-rays. This is an object that emits X-rays. Forget the optical. 
99.9% of all the energy that comes out of this source is in X-rays. So these sources are very, very special. And you can't even think of them as being sun-like. Sun -like. So the idea is what are they? In April 1967, the Australians discovered a source which was almost as bright as COEX-1, and they claimed that they looked at that source at that region of the sky four months earlier, and they saw nothing. So they called this source an X-ray nova, not unreasonable name, and they were jubilant because it happens to be located in the constellation, the Southern Cross. Therefore, they called the source Crooks X1. Why were they jubilant? They went bananas because the Southern Cross is in their flag. How tragic for them that when a more precise position became available, the source moved only one degree into the constellation of Centaurus. And so now we know this source as Senex 2. I remember shortly after this was published, I was on the phone with Herb Gursky, and Herb said to me, Walter, do you believe this nonsense? And that is so typical for those days. It wasn't believable that there was a source as bright as COEX one, one day and four months earlier there wasn't. Herb said, oh, of course, the first time the detectors didn't work. Do you believe that nonsense? Well, the source was there. And not only was the source there, but it was observed by various groups, and the source gradually in time faded. What you see here is um, two years of data. This is the X-ray intensity. These are three decades, so this is a logarithmic scale. And this was the time that the observation showed no source at all. And then here is the first observation on April 4, 1967. And then other groups came and other groups followed it, and then the source gradually decayed away. By the way, uh, we, no, we no longer call these sources NOVI. We call them now X-ray transients. In 1967, Herb Friedman wrote a paper with 30 sources, and he compared them, and these observations had been made over a period of about two years. And if you compared the observations of the same source, uh, months and years apart, there was clearly variability. The most noticeable was actually Cygnus X1. But again, no one had ever seen a source change its flux while you were looking at the source. And why was that impossible? Because a rocket was only five minutes above the atmosphere. You don't have very much time in five minutes. Even if you were to look at one source, you may not see variability. But of course, they scanned the sky in those five minutes. They wanted to see many sources. On October 15, 1967, SCOEX-1 was caught with a smoking gun. George Clark and I had a seven-hour balloon flight from Australia, and we observed that SCOEX-1, during our observations, while we were looking at it, went up by a factor of four in 10 minutes. Rockets could never have discovered that. I'd like to show you the data. Horizontal scale is time. And from here to here, is four hours of data. Balloons could fly 10 hours. I once had 26-hour balloon flight. That was the great advantage of the balloons. Uh, we, each data point is an observation of SCOEX-1. 
we did see it here, although the error bars are large, but near the end of the flight, it was unmistakable that coal became bright. In 10 minutes, it was flaring up, and then it went down again. So we submitted the paper to um, Astrophysical Journal Letters. Chandra Sakar was the editor. And we got a referee report back. And the referee report said, this must be nonsense, because we all know that sources so bright could never change by a factor of four in 10 minutes. You wonder what the guy, what he meant when he said, we all know. <laughs> so we wrote a note to Chandra Sarkar and we said, well, we're sorry, but uh, we stand behind our data. Chandra Sarkar called Bruno. And Bruno must have said a few nice things about George and me, because the paper was accepted. And that was the first time that the variability was observed while the source was observed. <laughs> Radio pulsars with a period of about 1.3 seconds were discovered in 1967 by Jocelyn Bell and Anthony Ewish. Anthony got the Nobel Prize for that in 1974, and Jocelyn did not share the Nobel Prize. That was a scandal, a blunder of astronomical proportions made by Stockholm. I've talked about this many times. I will leave it with this but you should remember that she should have shared in the Nobel Prize and did not. Shortly after their report of these radio pulsars, Dave Stalin at MIT looked at the Crab Nebula and he found the pulsar in the Crab Nebula and the period of that pulsar was 33 milliseconds. So, it was believed by that time already that the period was the result of rotating neutron stars. And so the 33 milliseconds meant that you had a neutron star that rotates around 30 times per second. It was in February 69 when I was preparing for new balloon observations that Jeffrey Burbage visited MIT. And I had lunch with Jeffrey. Many of you have known Jeffrey. He had a wonderful, deep voice. He laughed a lot. And when Jeffrey laughed, the ceiling was moving. <laughs> so I had lunch with him. And I said, Jeffrey, I was wondering, the time resolution of our telescope, of which George Ricker was part, uh, was only a few seconds, and don't you think it may be a good idea now that we know there are 33 millisecond pulsar in the crab, shouldn't we change the time resolution to milliseconds? And Jeffrey start to laugh. We were in a restaurant and people were looking around. And Jeffrey said, Walter, you will see no x-rays from any radio pulsar. You don't understand anything about pulsars. Well, he was right, but he didn't either. <laughs> because very shortly after that, Herb Friedman and independently Hale Brott discovered the 33 milliseconds in X-rays. In the years 1970 to 72, my balloon group, of which George Ricker was part, discovered sources that had never been seen with rockets. And the reason for that was that we had so much more observing time. These sources were very faint, very high energies. Rockets didn't stand a prayer. We discovered 301 minus 2. We discovered 304 minus 1. And the most important that we discovered was GX1 plus 4, because we noticed and reported that it was 
periodic with a period of about 2.3 minutes. At the time, we had no idea what that meant. Now we do, but it was the first source with a periodicity that long, 2.3 minutes. What are these sources? We knew the Crab Nebula. We knew that the luminosities in X-rays must have been horrendous. There were many sources known by that time, and the majority were in the galactic equator, so you can estimate statistically the distance, which is about the distance to the galactic center, must be approximately right, which is 25,000 light years, and so the X-ray luminosities of most 